everybody. Welcome to a Monday edition, a living room edition of Baseball Night in New York, brought to you by your Tri-State Cadillac dealers, Doug Williams, alongside Andy Martino and Anthony Recker. I hope everybody out there is doing okay, staying safe, staying healthy. Thanks, as always, for watching. Um, we want to start today talking about a guy. And this is always a fascinating topic with Mets fans. Uh, Daniel Murphy. Um, and it's interesting to talk to a former teammate of his and a guy who covered him for many years. Um, Murph was a good hitter and a good player. And then the 2015 postseason happened and the story of his Mets career changed entirely right before it ended. Um, and I think it's fascinating to look back at, at how he should be viewed in a Mets uniform and how uh, Mets fans should view him given the two perspectives that you two have. Um, so Andy, let's begin with you here because I know you have a unique perspective uh, in terms of what he was like to cover. Um, but how do you think Mets fans should view him? Should he be the hero or the villain? Well, he was a pain in the butt to cover for most of his Met tenure. And we both, I think, grew into each other a little bit. And we ha actually had this discussion before, whenever, maybe even a couple of years ago, we've been doing this show a while, but I actually refused to interview him for a couple of years because he was so rude. I was like, I'm not dealing with this guy and he's not going to get quoted in the Daily News. And then, uh, long story short, when he made some controversial comments about disapproving of homosexuality, I got him on the phone and we had a conversation about that and we disagreed, but he allowed me to write a column which was uh, presenting both sides in a way that I thought was productive. And I think we developed a mutual respect from there and I ended up really enjoying talking to him about hitting. So that's my perspective that you alluded to. From a Met fan perspective, I can't imagine how this would be a question or in any way controversial. Daniel Murphy's legacy with the Mets is positive, exclamation point, full stop. You're talking about a guy who gave his all for years. Was he a great base runner? Was he a great defender? No, but he was always really trying. Terrific hitter. Ends with this, one of the great postseason performances of all time. The Mets didn't want him. He signs with the Nationals, and he continues to play hard. It, I, I don't see any negative if you're a Mets fan. Great Mets. So Dave Mandel, our producer, has our edition of a full screen up. That's the 2015 that postseason. He got the Mets to a World Series. Um, the World Series for Murph was when he cooled down. Um, but that's forgiven considering the series that he had in the DS and the CS. Um, Anthony, the, the, the thing that Andy didn't really mention is the fact that the only reason his Mets career would be viewed in a negative light is because he's been a Mets killer. It wasn't that he had some great contract well, on the table with the Mets. To be and, fair, Doug, I, he wanted to come back and kill other teams, and the Mets wouldn't, wouldn't – Right, but that's the point I'm making. He's not a villain for not wanting to be a Met or anything like that. He's just a villain considering he has crushed them in multiple uniforms since then. So, Anthony, how do you think he should be viewed? Do you understand that fan perspective where it's like we get rid of this guy and he – he has one great postseason, and now he's a, a, an incredible hitter with the Nationals and others. Well, I absolutely understand the perspective from the fan side and seeing him come back and do that. From a player side, anytime you're playing against your former team, it doesn't matter what the reason is that you moved on. Whether it was, you know, it was free agency, maybe you got too expensive for the team because you had a great postseason and they just didn't feel like they could keep you. You're still going to have that intense focus and that intense desire to come back and really give it to them give it to him in a way that, I mean, <laughs> look at those numbers. I mean, that is yeah. just extraordinary. You could put that right up there with his postseason in 15 and the numbers almost line up. And it's, I mean, what the guy was able to do when he came back and played the Mets was just incredible. But I would still side on the side that he is an absolute Met hero to me. And simply because, I mean, from personal experience, I'm on that 15 team. He carried that team offensively, offensively, through that division series and the championship series. We knew we had a really good team going into spring training. We knew we had a good team coming out of spring training. And then once we made some of those deals, we knew we had a really good team that could compete. But all of a sudden, we're a World Series team and, and have an opportunity to put a ring and, and a trophy, you know, in the case and everything. That wasn't something that was really discussed. And he made a lot of that possible with the postseason he had. It was just incredible. When you're in the seats and you're a Met fan and you see Murph just time after time as a national just kill your team, it's more of an admiration and respect boo if you're booing him than if he had declined a huge offer that the Mets made and was like, I just don't want to be here anymore. No longer in the Mets rotation is Zach Wheeler. And he got paid with the Philadelphia Phillies. And I think a lot of us said, great, good for Zach Wheeler. 
Um, not necessarily sure this was a fit for the Mets or ever something that they considered. Um, but in retrospect, Anthony, is that something that the Mets should have considered? Do you think that now, looking back on it, that would have been a salary and a price that the Mets could have paid if they had known center guard would be out? I mean, they just couldn't have put that on the books. I mean, just plain and simple. Um, you know, would it have been nice to keep him around? Would they have maybe, you know, made the trade earlier, you know, instead of, um, you know, keeping holding on to him and not doing that? Maybe that might have had because then they might have gotten another piece outside of Stroman, um, you know, that could have, you know, helped soften the blow or whatever. But I mean, to me, it, it maybe whether he's worth five for 118 or not, whatever you think is your opinion. But when you go and look at this guy's comps online, go, go to any, you know, measurable website, analytical website, look at his comparisons, you're looking at just pure stuff. You're looking at Jacob deGrom, 19, Jacob deGrom, 18, Steven Strasburg, 19, Garrett Cole, 19. These are the comparables that these analytical computers are coming up with for the stuff that Zach Wheeler has. You also have to look at the fact that what was he when he came up? A huge uber prospect in this New York Mets system. We've seen it time and time again where those guys, Noah Syndergaard, Travis Darno, Zach Wheeler, Matt Harvey, they come up and they have these huge expectations and maybe they meet them a little bit, maybe they don't, whatever, but have any of them really panned out in the New York market playing for this New York team? Not necessarily. And is that their fault? I don't know. I can't say it is because they're coming up at 21, 22, 23, 24 years old and they're expected to save this franchise, which is what is said about them. That's a little bit silly to me. Um, and to me, Wheeler, what he was able to do, what he's accomplished so far in his career, I can't say he isn't worth the money. I mean, the guy got it. A team was willing to pay him that. And we don't know how many teams were out there competing to, to pay him that money. Uh, I would think there were quite a few, especially based on the comparisons I gave. So, Andy, Anthony brings up the other in retrospect aspect of this, which is the, the trade that the Mets decided not to make with Zach Wheeler. And I know last year you and I talked a lot about how his season should have been viewed. You thought that it was better than some of the, you know, the back of the baseball card stats may have suggested. Was that end of the season run um, worthwhile enough to hold on to a guy like Zach Wheeler, which would have sent a different message if you had traded him to your fan base? The move wasn't to trade him. The move was to sign him for four years between 60 and 70 million the previous spring, which they could have done. I can, I can tell you they could have done it on the player side. Uh, I know it, that they could have had Wheeler at that kind of price. Then Anthony's absolutely right. There were teams bidding up other than the Phillies. Wheeler actually turned down a higher offer from the White Sox who offered him in the 120s. So then you're in a point where you're like, those are some tough numbers. Uh, but the Mets were so focused on extending Jacob DeGrom that spring, which was the right thing to do. Uh, it was right to extend DeGrom. But their exclusive focus was on that. Their opportunity to sign Wheeler vanished. He got into his walk year. He was going to walk. At that point, he was going to test free agency. So it's not to me about should they have traded him or should they have given him 118. It, it was you should have signed him before any of those things were necessary. Were they ever seriously considering you mentioned they were signing both. They were, you know, negotiating with both potentially DeGrom and Wheeler. Did they ever consider no. doing both? Wheeler was serious about considering it. The Mets never were. They could have had him for cheap and they and they didn't pursue it. I understand them, you know, maybe being hesitant to do it. But when you look at the stuff the guy has, the, the spin rates he puts up, I mean, the, the velocity, the, the ability he has, I mean, you, you put all that stuff together and you're looking at a potential package. And if you can get that kind of potential, even if it's injury prone for four years and 60 or 70, you should have at least been considering it and at least talking with his agent, I think. I mean, I would have been uh, for sure. And that's me knowing him personally too, knowing what kind of guy he is. He's not just going to get that money and then go, oh, okay, I'm good. I'm just going to you know, come out for every five days and whatever happens, happens. He's still going to work for you. Okay, guys, well, two fascinating discussions about a couple fascinating former New York Mets. Andy Martino, Anthony Recker, thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.